This week, I've got a really interesting case to share with you. This case came from Canada, from a clinician called Victoria Pond, who has agreed to share everything that she went through when dealing with a very unusual vascular occlusion. It's an earlobe VO. I've never seen one before. And like we discussed in this program, most of us aren't taught in depth around how to avoid a vascular occlusion in the earlobe. So it's an amazing learning opportunity, thanks to the generosity of this amazing clinician who did a fabulous job getting her patient back to a safe place. So make sure you pay attention. While you're watching, I recommend you pay attention to the thinking behind each decision so that if you're ever in this situation, you are forearmed about how to get through this safely and get the best outcome for your patient. Thank you so much for um, volunteering to share this this interesting case with us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having pleasure. me. Pleasure. You look looking very smart and clinical with all your degrees Thank on you the so background. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, I mean, obviously, this is going out on the internet. I, I'm afraid we're renovating at the moment, so uh, it's an actual complete mess behind me. I'm trying to block it out with things. <laughs> oh, you know what? You can't even tell. So, You're good. <laughs> so, uh, Victoria Pond, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, whereabouts, whereabouts are you Are you based? Let's just get some of the kind of de the geography so people can understand where you are. Sure. I'm in uh, Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, not Peterborough, UK. Um, it is about an hour and a half east of Toronto. Great. And uh, what? T tell us a little bit about your setup. Like, do you work for yourself? Are you independent injector or...? What's going on? Yeah, so um, I work for myself. I have my own um, business. It's Bell Talks Beauty. It's just me at the moment. Um, I do work very closely with my medical director, however, so um, we do not have our business integrated, but we do work. We collaborate a lot. So it's very nice to have that extra support and that extra person to bounce things off of. Um, so currently I work in the same building as she does. So we have our own spaces, but we are uh, independently working. That's great. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a very similar setup to a lot of people in the UK, although having a medical director is less essential, um, but it's, it's good to understand. So how long have you been injecting for so far? I'm coming up on two years. Right. And have so you ever had a vascular occlusion before? This was my first one. <laughs> what, a, what an interesting first vascular occlusion. <laughs> it was a very interesting situation for sure. So this is why I was really excited to uh, to understand this case because uh, a lot of us, the, I don't think there are very, very many earlobe training courses out there. Um, so what you tend to do is get shown if you're lucky and it seems yep, yep. Re relatively straightforward and easy and it is actually. Um, yep, yep. But what your case highlights is that there is no perfectly safe place. And I have heard it said that it is a safe place to inject. And I'm sure it is relatively, but you know what it's like now. Uh, these things happen. Mm -hmm. So um, what I thought would be really cool is just to go through point by point uh, the case in detail and then cool. to kind of discuss it, what you learned and and share it as an example to everyone of the many elements of safety other than just your injection. Because um, one of the things I'm keen to point out is because so many people are so afraid of complications, they actually end up not doing procedures, which yeah. can be sensible. But actually, if you break it down into how to reduce the risk, um, the mm -hmm. frequency of vascular occlusion, how to um, reduce the severity of vascular occlusion, how to diagnose quickly, and how to treat comprehensively, you actually put yourself in a position where a true necrotic injury should probably not ever happen to you um now you've got to pretend like it is going to happen to you in order to have the anxiety that you need to put all the work in to not let it happen but at the same time i think statistically you could get through a career without any tissue damage not saying you'll never have vo but certainly not having tissue damage which is still where you are in your career you've never had anyone had tissue damage so um and that's because of what you did in this case yeah yeah okay cool so um tell us a little bit about what the indication was for this treatment why, why yeah. were we so my patient came to me, she had, um, in her teenage years, had spacers, so she had actually stretched out her lobes. Um, now that she's an adult, she's married, she, you know, wasn't really a fan of that look anymore, um, and just wanted her lobes to not look so ropey and hanging down anymore. Um, so in our consultation, I said, well, dermal filler can definitely uh, help you with that. Um, it can actually help to 
um, bring in the, uh, we'll obviously replace the lost volume, but also reduce the size of the hole. So we, we planned on having that as our treatment plan. Um, and full disclosure, this was my first time treating an earlobe. <laughs> so um, I was excited. Um, I had done all my research. Like you said, there, there's almost no training course or even information out there on how to inject an earlobe, let alone earlobe anatomy. So what I ended up doing was scroll through Instagram, looked at some hashtags, looked at some um, people that I trusted. Um, and thought that were very good clinicians who I had seen post videos of earlobes. So I had gone through and I watched some of their videos, you know, looked at their technique. Are they doing needle versus cannula? Are they saying anything specific? Um, and in my own Google search of ears, um, it, there's actually a lot of mixed information on their anatomy. It's mostly, oh, you know, here's the outer ear and this is what it looks like and the vasculature isn't so pronounced. So actually trying to find that information was very hard. Um, and then I actually resorted to thinking, okay, well, what do I know about ears? What do I know about ears as a nurse and as, as a person? So I know that they can get you know, very hot, very cold, very quickly. So obviously that there is some vasculature and there's a lot of vasculature near the surface. Um, I, there's no palpability of any vessels in the ear. Um, we pierce ears all the time and ears are mostly cartilage. Mm -hmm. So with that information, I was thinking, okay, it's a fairly safe area to inject. Yeah. I'm I love this, um, first, this first principled approach to assessing something. Um, it, it, I think. Uh, well, what I'd like to do is actually come back and uh, once we've got exactly what happened and do a discussion on that, because that that way of thinking is super valuable. And I think uh, it's actually in many ways more dangerous just to replicate what someone shows you once rather than what yeah. you've gone through, which is to break down as many facets as you can and and then make a clinical decision about whether you think it's, it's relatively safe. Um, but that, that's really good that you've done this kind of thinking. Do, so do you mind saying what product it was you were using? I chose to use um, Chroma Safa, their softer filler. Mm -hmm. um, and I chose that specifically because I know that it dissolves out very well. Um, I always choose a filler that I know it's rheology and it's dissolving profile inside and out for a new area. When I started doing temples, I did the same thing. Um, so with okay. an earlobe, I chose this specific product because I know that although it doesn't typically last as long um, in in where the place that I put it, but I knew that I could dissolve it out easily if I needed to, which yeah. luckily so or unluckily I had to. <laughs> soft product, um, easily dissolvable, hyaluronic acid product. So um, yeah. that's all very much on the safe end of the spectrum. It's interesting, the longevity, because I've often wondered, I've never found any data on how long it lasts, but it would seem to me that you might get quite a long time out of it because it's kind of an enclosed space almost. But have you found something different that it doesn't last that long in earlobes? I, I found, so what I do with every single product that I bring on is I inject it into myself first. Um, and so I can explain how it feels, how it's going to settle, um, and any sort of abnormalities that might, or differences that might occur. So with this one, I've noticed, um, and I used it very on early in my career, that it just didn't last as long mm -hmm. in a lip specifically. So I thought, you know, okay, this is, the reps told me about this, how it's, you know, very easily dissolvable. And I'm seeing this being dissolved out naturally very quickly as well. Yeah. It's worth saying there for the chroma people listening that uh, a lack of longevity is not necessarily a bad thing. Like no. it can be, it can be, it can be a really good thing for patients that it doesn't persist for twelve years. Um, yes. Okay. So um, next question is: Can you describe to me what the technique that you used? How did you approach entering the ear? I'm particularly interested in the angle and the relationship to the rest of the head. Whether you're kind of parallel with the earlobe or uh, just describe a little bit about how you did it. Yeah, so I mostly went fairly parallel with the earlobe. I did a lot of retrograde threading just to give support um, and also microboluses near the opening of the 
um, the piercing that she had had to close it out. So I had kind of gone around more at a 45 degree around that one just to try to push that closer and closer. Um, but to give support, I just did retrograde fairly. <coughs> I note um, it's uh, as earlobes go is probably on the complex side because the, the number of holes and then creases as well. So it's, that's what I'm hearing reflected in your technique is that it wasn't just a volumizing injection. You were trying to work around a relatively large hole and creases and volume. Yes. And she had other piercings um, adjacent to it as well. So actually getting into it from certain angles was not as possible. So I had a very limited area where I could actually work. Mm -hmm. And how much volume do you think you put in by the end of it? I think I put in like 0.3 or 0.4 per earlobe. Okay, 0.3 of a mil. And yeah. then uh, in terms of number of entries, what, did you do it all through one hole or were you kind of doing multiple entry points? I definitely did multiple entry points. So, so that also probably means different angles as well. You're probably trying to work around a hole. You probably have to use different angles, which, which might yeah. in retrospect be one of the things that added to the risk is that it wasn't because mm -hmm. in a perfect wor world, you just choose the lowest risk angle of entry. But if you've got a hole in the way or two holes, yep. then you have to do other things. So uh, that's a good learning point to think about. Um, okay, uh, when when did you first notice, or what was the first sign that there may be a vascular compromise? So this was the the sign that was ended up being compromised was the first side that I did, and I noticed that this one had bled a lot more than the other one. So I had noticed some sort of what I thought at the time was a hematoma forming, um, right adjacent to the hole that I had been trying to fill in essentially. Um, at the time, uh, everything looked good. I didn't have any concerns about capillary refill. Um, one was not more, you know, engorged than the other. Um, and she was in, you know, generally no pain either. It actually wasn't until, I wanna say two days later, she sent me a message and just said, hey, this one year low just is, you know, a lot more swollen than the other one. And I'm thinking at this point, yeah, like there was a lot more bleeding that happened at that, on that side. So that makes sense. But, you know, to err on the side of caution, I said, can you send me a photo? Um, and she did. And now the lighting was off, but I looked at it and I was like, you know what? I, I'm not sold that this is an okay result. Mm -hmm. So I said, come on in. Like, I just want to take a look at it. And when she walked in, big purple instant. Oh no, this is abnormal. And I got to do something now. Did she have any pain by that stage? She, she I was having some pain. Um, it was a little more nondescript. It was like, just more like a general fullness feeling. Um, and by looking at her, obviously that there had been some sort of occlusion happening and it had swollen to uh, quite larger than the other side. So obviously that there was some swelling in, in such a small compartment that mm -hmm. it was causing her a significant discomfort. Okay. And so was, was the thing that made her call you what it looked like or what it felt like? Do you remember? I think it was a little bit of both. I, she had said, you know, oh, I've been injected tons of times before and, you know, I'm, I'm used to it feeling, you know, sore and tender afterwards. And I've treated her before in the past as well. So she and I have done plenty of filler together. So she knows um, what to look for, but she had kind of said, you know, it just didn't look right to me. Mm -hmm. So th this is another, that's another great point to take home. Um, I remember learning actually in pediatrics the first time of always listen to the mum because mums yeah. know their children. And it's a bit like mm -hmm. that with an experienced patient. If they, if you're someone, if your patient who you've had for years rings you concerned, that's much more worrying than a newbie who's never had a treatment. You should take them both seriously, of course, but that, yeah. that taking into account the, the overall experience and the characteristics of the patient, because some people are super laid back and I always worry about them if they call, if they call me. Um, yeah. But also <laughs> maybe if they're super anxious, you might, you might be on the other end of the, of the spectrum, but it's, um, it's nice to take that into account. Yeah. Yeah. 
it uh yeah i it was when she had you know said oh you know something is is going on it she is a more laid back client and she mm. she's we've been through this together so she uh was like yeah i, I she's she actually said to me i i knew something was going on and i thought eh it's probably fine <laughs> <laughs> But I'm glad I contacted you anyway, just to check yeah. it out. So, so what uh, what did you see on the, on assessment when you examined her at that stage? So one compared to the other lobe that I had treated, this one was significantly larger. Obviously, the coloration was very disturbing. There was also some; it was purple up the lobe, and it had started like um like a webbing um, whiteness up into the main part of the ear. Um, capillary refill test. There was no capillary refill whatsoever anywhere. Wow. On the lobe. So um, very indicative to me what was going on. And, so that's uh, yeah, that's super interesting because obviously at at the two day point you've got this question over hematoma versus um, vascular mm. occlusion, and mm. uh, the the guiding principle. It's very confusing when it's delayed capillary refill because quite often that is a hematoma. But if you're saying no capillary refill, that at least it actually doesn't matter if there's filler in the vessel or not. You can have a hematoma that causes compression. So that is absolutely an indication to reverse it. So um, I, I'm, I'm pleased that you had such a black and white because it, it does get very gray if it's a three second capillary refill. Um, yeah. But I think at that stage, that that's very clear. So e easy diagnosis. Mm. Um, what what was your patient like at this point? What what were they thinking about? Were they anxious? Um, did they know about what a vascular occlusion was and what, why they were back? Yes. So she was fully aware of what a vascular occlusion was from our past appointments. Um, so she was actually very calm and collected. I think internally I was probably freaking out more than she was, um, which was kind of nice because when she came in, she said, you know what, I know you've got this. Um, and I had already told her, you know, take two aspirin and come, come in right away. So she was able to drop everything and come in very luckily. Um, and she was just like, okay, we're going through this together. It's, it's going to be fine. So that, so that moment when your patient gets told about the, what they've got wrong with them and you're, and uh, is it well basically the best guide of what your consent process was like so mm -hmm. she sounds educated like none of this is a complete mm -hmm. shock out of the blue yeah. and that tells me that you did a really a really good job of explaining these things previously so she's an educated patient who's not mm -hmm. panicking but, mm -hmm. but that's partly because none of this is a sudden what the hell's a vascular occlusion so i and i think that's another really important point to take from this because there are, there are many clinicians who brush over uh, the consent process to try not to make their patients anxious or even mm. as just a signed form. Now, unfortunately, although that makes them relaxed at that stage, when something bad ha does happen, it's a hundred times more stressful because they don't know, they haven't thought about this thing. So you're suddenly putting them deeply out of their comfort zone saying your earlobe might drop off in this case. So mm. that that's a really good sign that you talk this through to her. Do, do you remember um, what sort of, what sort of, how do you normally consent a patient for a vascular occlusion? What do you tell them about it? Uh, so when I, I have them fill out their medical history form and then when I say, okay, now we're going to go over the consent part, um, I start with the, <laughs> the easy things, you know, mm -hmm. the bruising, swelling, infection risk, yada, yada, yada. And then I say, and then the most important thing you need to look for is something called a vascular occlusion. And I explain what it is. Um, filler either inside a vessel or compressing a vessel. It's impeding blood flow. It's considered a medical emergency. And then I tell them what to look for. Um, I do tell them that most of the time I can catch it before they even leave, that I check extensively for a capillary refill before they go. So I'm confident that they don't have it, but there is such a thing as a late onset one, um, as I've discovered. Um, and then I do tell them that they do need to come back immediately. It is time sensitive and that I can reverse it in office um, because I do now carry a very healthy stock of hyaluronidase with me. So um, that usually, I usually get the, the eye opening moment. Um, if I don't, I 
we'll go back and say, do you understand all this? <laughs> um, and then once we go into, okay, but this is what we can do about it. Um, usually they say, okay, like this is, I feel better about this. Um, and I make sure that they are engaged and looking at me while I go over this before they sign anything. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I mean, I, I, I couldn't explain it better to myself what a good consent process does, because you, you, you're, you're literally aiming to trigger a bit of anxiety and then reassure them yeah. with what you how you look after them, which is how you know they've really understood it. Because if, mm -hmm. if you get through that whole process without your patient batting an eyelid, they probably don't understand what you're talking about. They've, yeah, they've yeah. blocked it out. So that that is probably one of the most important things people can take mm -hmm. from this is the story not to shy away from the truth. But yeah. then to have your backup plan well, not, it's not your backup plan. It's what you will actually do to prevent it and treat it if it does happen, which is exactly what you've done. So you've actually lived that entire story now with your patient. And it mm -hmm. was exactly how you said it would be, which is also fantastic. I'm sure she'll have a lot of trust in you. Has, uh, the, interestingly, that, that's often a good marker of how well the whole thing was dealt with is, it, does, has she been put off treatment for life or is she laid back about having treatment in the future? What no, do you think? she's been back. Yeah. Well done. So that that's that's the biggest validation you can get that you've uh, that the whole process has been handled really well. Yeah. Okay. So um, so tell me a little bit about your reversal. How did you go through the process of reversing this occlusion? Yeah. So immediately it was kind of like, okay, what's the area we're dealing with? Earlobe, small. It is localized. It's a small compartment. It's going to be a small artery that we've occluded. So trying to cannulate might be difficult. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start the protocol that's based on your protocols. My medical director has gone through all of your courses. So um, the protocol we have in place is, you know, we've, we've done the ASA, um, we're gonna start flooding with uh, 1500 uh, units uh, per mil of pyloronidase. Uh, one to one <coughs> normal and just flooding the area, flooding the area, heat, massage, reevaluate, repeat. So we did that. We did six rounds of that for the first day, just over and over and over, different planes, different angles, different areas, just trying to get whatever it was that was going on in the earlobe without, you know, overfilling it with saline and because of the small size. So it, it, it improved by the end. Um, we were getting capillary refill back, which was good. Um, and we said, okay, let's, let's step away from this for a little bit and reevaluate in a couple hours. So later on checked in, um, everything was still improving. Fabulous, happy. Uh, I said, be prepared to come in tomorrow morning. <laughs> We're gonna take a look at this again. So uh, the next morning was when she started to have the discoloration behind the ear and onto the neck. Now at this point, I got really nervous. This, I thought either two things, either because of this such a small area and because of the time that it had been like the blood had been sitting in there and the release of it has pushed it elsewhere into the tissue and we're seeing you know old red blood cells sitting in the tissues and that's what we're seeing it as or with the anatomy that i know now very well <laughs> there's the the temporal artery that goes here but it also leads into the carotid and my background is in intensive care nursing. And I'm thinking, oh no, if the carotid's involved, this is gonna be difficult. There's endarctomies, there's stroke risk. And if we've, you know, basically taken shards of the filler and it's now gone into the circulation, this could potentially cause an embolism somewhere else. Um, the carotid's a very large vessel so cannulating that is going to be tricky <laughs> and and at this point i'm like okay let's let's think this through and checking the capillary refill behind the ear it was fine mm -hmm. we decided on the safe side we'd do some more rounds of 
the hyaluronidase in the earlobe. And we'd also do it um, basically behind the ear, just subdermally in case anything else is going on there. So we did another five vials total, another five rounds. And by then, the next day, perfect cap refill. This was still lingering, but it had improved. And in the next coming days, it had improved 100%. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah, I, I love the way that you thought through the anatomy in the worst case scenario there, um, <laughs> even though it turned out not to be anywhere near the worst case scenario. Yeah. Uh, I do think hyaluron days, the, what it does stopping, it kind of causes dispersal of anything. So it can yeah. disperse blood. You often get if you look at if you do a pre an intradermal test, you often get this weird ring around it like 24 hours mm -hmm. later. But like, I don't know if you remember it, I remember at university learning about this southern, you know, the, the blots of protein sizes and they all move at different sizes according to yes. the so it's it's like that, it just spreads uh, sometimes. Yeah. Um, but that thought process is excellent because you're 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 thinking about the anatomy and the potential the potential um impact much more broadly than just the ear, um, which is which is exactly the right thing to do. Um, the, the, the thought I had was that this is one of the reasons I do worry about injecting a hyaluron day straight into a vessel. That's extremely anecdotal, but I do know of one case in the UK, it wasn't an aesthetic practitioner, but in accident emergency, they flushed someone who had visual problems and then he mm -hmm. had central nervous system symptoms after that. So mm -hmm. the idea that you put a large volume into the vessel, um, with hyaluron days or not, I, I just worry about these fragments going deeper into the system. I'm I'm more of a fan of localized extravascular hyaluron days, um, but it's something to think about anyway. I, I don't know. None of us know the answer for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there, there's also deactivating enzyme within your within your blood plasma, so I don't think hyaluron days last very long when mm -hmm. it's intravascular. I, it makes sense to me to have a high concentration outside the vessel uh, and then give it time. But maybe when people watch this, you can let let me know your comments, what you think. Uh, in the comments because it is an area lots more people are talking now with ultrasound they're speaking more about in injecting into the vessel but I, I think we've got to think about it longer um because there is this other variable so and, and in this case especially because you were you're risking an earlobe you're trying to save an earlobe but if you were, did get intravascular injected if there wasn't a filler you would be putting it into the carotid now it's external carotid so you you're you're more worrying about the superficial temple artery if you're unlucky mm -hmm maybe the maxillary artery, a small branch in there, but um, all, all quite unlikely to happen, I think, if uh, even getting into it. So um, so you've, so we, we've got this bruise, which, which I think in retrospect is just bruising caused by the procedure and the spread of product. Is that what you think? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You check the refill again to make sure, I mean, it's low risk at trying, just making sure that everything's unblocked. You do a little bit more hundred days. And at what stage did you say, um, that's it, we've done all we can and we're happy with it? So after the second day and after the 11th vial that we had used, um, it was just another, okay, go home. We'll revisit this tomorrow. And it, it improved, huge improvement immediately after Great. that. So we said, okay, we're gonna just continue to monitor, check in as, as long as everything's going and the way it should, I'm, I'm happy. She was happy. My director was happy. So after about two days afterwards, everything had resolved. Mm -hmm. so do you, do I, you remember the moment where you thought this is it? This is actually going to be okay now. It was probably that third that third day after. It was just like a, okay, I can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I I think we've done it. Uh, improvements have happened. Um, and at that point, I was like, okay, I think, fingers crossed that everything's going to be all right. Great. So it was three days of intense stress. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's like you, you're you running at this. It's just complete uncertainty until that clicks in your head, and then you can yeah. you can finally relax. Yeah. So, um, so I think I've, I've got well, gone through all those key stages. So tell me a little bit about what you what you've learned through this whole process like what how are you thinking about earlobes and vascular occlusions now yeah so there's definitely a healthy amount of of fear that has been transformed into safety protocols um patient consenting um a very thorough thorough consent 
Um, and I'm also very, very open and honest with my patients that this has happened. I've seen it happen and um, we, we can deal with it. Um, they often are a little nervous at first when I say it, it will happen, it can happen. Um, and then when they hear, okay, you've, you've dealt with it, you know what you're doing, they feel a lot better. So it's, I feel that I've, I've been able to take that fear, not let it, not let it hinder my practice, but rather that extra step, that extra thought for patient safety always. Um, yeah. And no area is a safe area. There's just lower risk areas mm -hmm. than others. <laughs> There's no such thing as a safe area. Um, in this case, I don't know whether it was a variation in anatomy, whether I just got unlucky, whether it was my technique, maybe a bit of all three, but there's there's just that one little needle poke that can change a perfectly well-executed, no VO situation into something that's going to be something you're gonna to have to deal with. Yeah, uh, that's perfect as well. I, I think the, the best state of mind is that you, because some you there's two ways you can go after a vascular delusion. You can think, because you'd be in within your rights to say, you know what, that's not that scary. I can deal with it because you've now done it. It's a whole different thing from just wondering about what it's like. You can now go through the process and prevent tissue death. So you could then become more relaxed about injections, thinking, oh, VOs are overblown. Anyone can deal with them. And actually, that'll make it, things <laughs> a lot worse. Um, yeah. So the right thing is actually to have a it's because it's a funny how people look at these things and come up with wildly different conclusions. You can actually now think, gosh, VO is a real thing that actually happens to practitioners like me. I better make sure that I'm doing more things to make my patients safer and mm -hmm. talking about them more often because uh, that's the ideal situation. So you're not, I'm really, really important to me that safe practitioners like yourself who worry about it don't get put, put off doing procedures, but instead weave back in and become safer by by using this experience to educate patients as you're doing right now mm -hmm. and uh, and then but actually using it in your consultation and your injections and your injection process and your aftercare process so everything feeds back in and actually makes the system safer rather than stops the system working altogether or or makes it run faster without safety so that that's mm -hmm. exactly the right mindset for this to benefit everyone so which is really cool mm -hmm. um Tell me a little bit about what you learned about the anatomy of the earlobe, because I'm I'm interested in that. I did see on your Instagram you posted some of the, which I love as well. I love I love that it's almost yeah. like your reflective diary on Instagram, which is such a great way of of actually yeah. using it. So you get to teach everyone while while you learn yourself as well. So yeah. what did you learn about those little vessels in particular? I'm interested in. Yes. So basically, there's the there's the um, the, the superficial temporal. Uh, there's branches that there's the anterior auricular uh, arteries that basically go into the lobe and then there's one that goes more into the upper ear and then there's all these tiny tiny little branches um, and that's kind of the blood flow to the ear and then there's also one there's a post auricular that goes behind the ear um, so that's a branch uh, again off of the um, superior temporal artery so there's uh, and then that there's also the occipital, which is there as well. So there's there's all these like little tiny ones that you don't really think yeah. about. That they're, they're not you know your your facial artery that you think about or your uh, labial arteries or anything. But there's there, these ones are they're there and mm. they will get you <laughs> if you're not careful. <laughs> I was interested in the because um, obviously earlobes have a the two different varieties of earlobes that you'll see with people. So mine you know, mm -hmm. hang down. I don't, I can't actually see yours, but you might have one that I, I, do they attach? No, they're more like they're a bit more attaching yeah, direct. So yeah. that, that may predispose you to a different location of the artery. I don't know. Uh, and it's, as you say, it's very hard to find. There's not a lot of stuff on the nuances of the vessels in the ear. Cause I don't think they're that important to most people uh, compared with as they are for us. So the, the, the may, maybe someone can do a study it might make a cool ultrasound study if you can see them to see the varieties of the entry points yeah. for the vessel but it it could be quite different if the earlobe looks different um yeah. you might have it coming in more inferiorly and that might change what you do mm -hmm. um so the, but that's interesting i recommend anyone who's doing these procedures is to at least google and have a look at some of these pictures to get a rough idea of where the angle of angle of that artery and how it may enter because obviously it may reduce your risk if you're entering at 90 degrees to it yeah, 
Yeah, there's uh, there's almost no education that I've been able to find on earlobes. Yeah, it is tough. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, like I said right at the beginning, it's important that the, one of the core messages I'm trying to get now is not to be put off by vascular occlusion, but ask mm -hmm. yourself, how do I decrease the frequency of this happening? So if you were to think about earlobe VOs, were there anything that you could think of doing or that you already do or did do that might make vascular occlusion less less frequent? Um, I've, I've thought about maybe approaching it with a cannula instead. Mm -hmm. um, however, small area, probably you need a very tiny cannula. Um, but that's definitely an option. Um, yeah, I think that would with, decrease frequency. Yeah, with the rise of uh, ultrasound, I think that's definitely a very easy place. It's you know small enough, just one little shot, see where it is. Um, that's definitely um, a good one if you have ultrasound in your practice. Um, aspiration is always a good idea. Um, and you know micro aliquots in such a small area can definitely, you know, okay. decrease pushing a bunch of stuff into a vessel. So that, that would fall under a differentiation I make, which is difference between frequency and severity. So small aliquots okay. will actually increase the frequency because you're doing more injections, but at least they'd be very small. And, mm -hmm. and sever for me, severity is much more of a problem than frequency, because as you've demonstrated, you can dissolve a small VO, a big yeah. VO, um, mm -hmm that goes into the superficial temple artery or even worse, the, the, the carotid is a whole different thing. So, yeah. um, so, so decreasing the severity is just doing small amounts and checking in between. Yeah. Uh, anything you could have done to diagnose more quickly, do you think? Because you did, you did say you did completely refill on the day. So you checked on the day and, and yeah. that was normal. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure anything else that we could do to make it less of a weight. I think in this case, just client education is super important mm -hmm. when, when they're out of your office, they're the ones who are looking at themselves and, you know, can notice any changes. So if you've been able to, you know, instill in them, this is what it's going to look like. This is the early stages. Um, then they are more likely to contact you in that situation. If there is any concern, I always say any concern whatsoever even a bruise that you're, you're not too happy about, contact me, we can troubleshoot together. And if, if we think something's going on, you can come back and we can take a look at it. And how do your patients contact you? I give them my personal cell phone number. Yeah. And so they, do they send you like WhatsApp messages, texts or? Usually a text. Um, yeah. I'll usually say, send me, a, send me a picture of the area of concern. Um, and if, if it looks suspicious, um, or if they are telling me something that is in alignment with a potential adverse reaction, I'll say, okay, let's do a capillary refill test. I want you to film it for me, send it to me, make sure you're in good light, make sure I can see it. I want you to tell me what you see as well. Um, and if we are still concerned or if they are in this position where they either can't film with good lighting where I can see it really well, or they are concerned. Um, I just say, come on back. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Great. Absolutely. A very, very comprehensive list. So that's a very tight connection with you and your patients. You know, that mm -hmm. the lack of having in between people is definitely a benefit. And, uh, yeah. and it sounds like you've given us a lot of thought with how you're teaching them to actually communicate with you. It's not just a picture, you know, it's videos, good lighting, all that stuff is, is excellent. Um, okay. What about completeness of reversal? I mean, this, this is something which you did seem to show up with your second assessment. Like, how did you make sure that you'd understood the complete area of occlusion? Um, it was, it was really just a, knowing that I had flooded everything that I could, um, the timing and the progression of healing with it, with the um, discoloration in the back of the ear was, as that got better, that was fairly indicative of, okay, it's getting better. Um, did, and you, did you check anywhere else on the face after diagnosing the VO here? Like, oh, cap refill pretty much everywhere up here. 
into the temporal, every like behind the ear. Um, it had been initially localized to the lobe. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then as it's the, the discoloration spread to the back of the ear, that was when I was like, okay, like let's go a little bit wider. Yep. Uh, everything. Right. So that, that's something I've certainly been caught up with myself in a vascular occlusion situation is tunnel vision for the area that you injected and mm -hmm. then only later on discovering that there's there's somewhere else it's usually close by but you can you can definitely get tunnel vision so as part of any assessment just have a moment where you think more broadly before you go back to the the area that's taking all your attention um, yeah. and and often that saves you a few hours yeah I find a really good assessment tool is the bilateral assessment, checking on each side comparatively. Um, the peace sign that we we talked about, Julie Bass Kaplan is mm -hmm. a big fan of peace sign, uh, just comparing two areas. Um, those comparisons are very helpful as well. Yeah, um, I'll give you one other, which is uh, related to that, is a is a full hand compression. Um, I've I found that helpful in in complex VOs where you're you're just not sure exactly where the delay is and if you if you do a nice long like a 10 second squeeze and then release quite often you can see it the blood rushing in from various places and having a little delay somewhere somewhere near the the original vascular occlusion so it's a same principle just it's it's harder when your bilateral is so far away from each other um, yeah. to see so it it can work well to do a full face very helpful for mid face vascular occlusions and cheeks i, I always compress the whole area and then release yeah. and it just makes it a little bit clearer Oh, that's um, an excellent tool. Yeah. Um, great. So uh, hats off to you. I can tell by talking to you that you've given this stuff a lot of thought and you've thought <laughs> through the whole process. Um, I really, I loved your consent process, the, di the diagnostic process, and then your actual reversal. Everything very, very well done. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm sure this is going to help someone that probably neither one of us will ever meet. Um, yeah, I hope and, so. Uh, and, and that makes patients safer after all. So yeah, you're yeah. doing a fantastic job. And I really, I really appreciate you sharing the story with us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tim. It was great uh, chatting with you about this. Okay. Um, any other questions or thoughts that I've missed? I don't think so. Um, how do you approach a near lobe? <laughs> uh, so it's, it, you know, exactly what you said is, is exactly how I approached it, which is like, I want to, I want to figure out how this all works and make a, a clinical decision based on what I know about these things about what a safe way of approaching it is. Um, so I, I would, I, I would try and go at 90 degrees to the vessel, but I, but what was interesting about your case is this is that you had multiple other things going on, like two, two rather large holes and lines and wrinkles. And it just makes it, you just, you can't do what, whatever might be perfect. Like it's real life, isn't it? It's not your textbook. So you, um, but I don't think I would have done anything different. I, I do. So what, what could I, what could you do to make it even safer? Maybe knowing where that artery is, you could potentially, it wouldn't be the most, most convenient, but maybe it's about pointing the needle away from it. So maybe coming. Like going along it. That's, so pointing away. I don't know if that'd make, no, then you're going to be at right angles to it. Yeah. It's hard. Maybe away in that way. That might be the safest, but it's the least convenient way because you've got the yeah. cartilage in the way. Um, I, I think you, been extremely unlucky so you could probably do exactly the same thing like ten thousand <laughs> times and not get one yeah uh, so the, the other thought i had was it's only a small space mm -hmm. if you were to go in to a place that you know is safe aspirate and then do a bolus maybe maybe not all one in one shot but a small injection check for a refill but the same spot so that you're not moving the needle all over and then squeeze the product into where you want it to go that that might make it safer obviously you've got the problem with severity with high volume so i'm not so sure about that i might do that if i knew there was no vessel say it ultrasounded it and i could mm -hmm. see where the vessel was i might put a bolus where i knew the vessel wasn't and then massage it but okay. that's not going to help you with a complex case like yours because you had lines wrinkles holes so yeah, yeah. i don't think it would have worked as that well but if it was a simple volume loss procedure that might that might be a safer way of doing it mm -hmm. um so th there's nothing what can I say? There's nothing, there's nothing hugely different to what you've done in that whole process. Um, often what I end up with is the consultation side of stuff, which it sounds like you did really well. So actually raising their anxiety a little bit. So they call you the right time. 
sometimes the patient will say something like, oh, it did hurt a bit. And I took painkillers and went to bed hoping it'd be okay in the morning. And then I would feed that back in and say, pain, you shouldn't need painkillers for for an isolated location. You know, one area that's particularly sore, I yeah, wouldn't yeah. consider that uh, painkillers that you need to be consulted again. Mm -hmm. I had a patient like that recently who just killed it with lots of painkillers and then obviously got worse. <laughs> Not one of my patients, but it's a, I learned from them all. There's, there's usually something. Um, there's not, there's nothing glaring, but often it'll come to me later that, oh, maybe there's one thing you could, you could tweak. Was, was there anything that you would have emphasized differently or maybe done differently now with benefit of experience? I think I would probably, like, I used a fairly small gauge. I feel like I, I probably poked probably too many times. <coughs> um, but I think just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I, there's so only so many ways you can approach a near lobe, unfortunately. Yeah, and, I, I agree. I don't think it's a, it's that obvious what, what, what could be improved upon. Um, so, but cannula was one idea. So I always like to just get one, just take one idea. And so, and you definitely will decrease. I, I've never used a cannula in ears and it, it, you, are you right? It would have to be quite a small one. And, yeah. um, but that, that might be something to try and see if it's mm -hmm. as e if it works easily and it goes in easily, you might find it easy. So yes. that's, that's something we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, as I said, fantastic job. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I hope that you feel confident to, to go on and do all the other procedures, but just with a few more ways of increasing the safety, which which ultimately is a benefit to everyone, yeah, yeah. you know, even yeah. if it slows you down a bit. Yeah. Okay. I'd rather take that extra step than, you know, just to get it done. I would rather, I would rather sleep at night knowing that I did everything. Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, well done and good luck with your practice. Hopefully we'll meet in person one day. Um, yeah. But I really appreciate your time. Yeah, no, thank you so much. This was a this is a great chat. Great. Thanks for coming. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye now.